Hello everyone, welcome to Ekam IAS Academy, Hyderabad. So today we are going to discuss about the UPSC prelims 2023 history related questions. Before getting into the history question detailing analysis and all that, I would like to give you a small breakup with regarding how the questions were organized in history this year. So if you look at the sources of the questions, history, the total number of questions that got asked this year were 30, out of which 8 questions you will get them from standard textbooks. Okay. Next, 4 questions you can answer if you go through NCRTs if you follow them clearly. So one question the source is unknown. So that question we will discuss. If you look at the breakup of the questions based on the toughness of the given questions, in history out of the 13 questions, 4 questions they were of high difficulty level, right. So next, 4 questions they were of moderate difficulty and 5 questions definitely we can say they are easy because we mark them easy because they are directly available in standard textbooks, NCRTs and any other uh, general material that UPSC aspirants follow. But 4 questions they were diff really difficult, right. This was the breakup with regarding the toughness level of the questions. Next. So if you look at the contribution of our Ekam IAS Academy Hyderabad, so in history from the classroom foundation lectures, especially the material part, so we will show you the material also. From that material and classroom lectures, we could contribute 9 questions this year out of the 13 questions. So 9 out of 13 students, they came from our classroom foundation lectures and material. From the rapid revision part, which we have conducted in mid-May, so we could contribute 2 questions from history. Next. So from the classroom mentorship discussion, so mentorship is held, so where answer writing sessions, so mock tests they are all held. So in that session, we could come up with one question which is asked in the exam, right. So totally 12 questions out of 13 we could discuss in the classroom mentorship sessions and rapid revision. So out of the 13 questions, we could contribute 12 questions this year to the UPSC prelims paper from the history subject. So now we will get into the question, the detailing, so how it was asked and then so how the question was framed, so and the analysis part we will be discussing now. So the first question in history, with reference to the Indian history, Alexander Ree, A. H. Longhurst, Robert Sewell, James Burgess, Walter Elliot, they were associated with what, right. So all these people, they were associated with history research and archaeological excavations in British India. If you look at Robert Sewell, Robert Sewell, he is very much known for his work on Vijayanagara Empire, okay. Next, if you look at Walter Elliot, Walter Elliot, he was a famous natur naturalist, so he did lot of history research even in Amaravati part of Andhra Pradesh. Next, Alexander Ree, A. H. Longhurst, these people, they have done extensive research in Tamil Nadu region, so the Pallavaram, all those areas and also they have done research with regarding Nagarjuna Konda also, right. So all these people, they were associated with archaeological excavations of Nagarjuna Konda, Amaravati, Vijayanagara, uh, these areas, fine. So they were associated with the archaeological excavations. Remember one thing, from the days of the Ayodhya verdict and all that, the British era excavations, archaeological findings, writings about the structures and all that, they have gained importance. So that is the reason why UPSC has picked up this question which is a completely unconventional thing. So the sources regarding the question and all that, they are unknown and definitely it was one of the difficult questions asked this year, right. In history. Next question in history following pairs. So this is a classic question or you can say regular question that, that is asked by UPSC. So from the art culture part of ancient or medieval India, right. So Besnagar, 
Shaivate cave shrine, this is given as Shaivate cave shrine. Next Bhaja, so Buddhist cave shrine. Next Sitanavasal, Jain cave shrine. So, if you look at these three, Base Nagar is not a Shaivite cave shrine. So, it is a Vaishnava shrine. It is a Vaishnava thing. It is a Vaishnava, uh, what you can say, structure or you can say a temple kind of thing, pillar kind of thing, and all that. You find that in Base Nagar in Madhya Pradesh. It is a place near Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh. So, if you look at the options, so if you know this base Nagara as something related to Vaishnava tradition and all that, okay, so then you will not go for this all three. This is eliminated. Generally, none is definitely not the case. Generally, in UPSC, right. So, you can definitely go for this only two option because Baza, it is Buddhist cave shrines. It is strongly related to the Buddhist tradition. Next to Sitanavasal in Tamil Nadu, they are Jain cave shrines, right. Even in, in Sitanavasal, we, you even find paintings also, right. So, this is, so this thing, we have got it in our material. If you have a glance at our material, 5th King Kasiputra Bhagavadra or 9th King Bhagavata as indicated by the notable Base Nagar Pillar Madhya Pradesh inscription of Heliodorus, okay. So, this is the base Nagar pillar. So, Heliodorus, so the last rulers of Sringa were Bhagabhadra and Devabhuti. Heliodorus was the Greek ambassador of Indo Greek ruler who probably stayed in Shunga's court. In this inscription, he described himself as a Bhagavata and that is a worshipper of Lord Krishna and Garuda and declares that he had set up this pillar in honor of God, in honor of this God. So, it is very clear that base Nagar, it is associated with Lord Krishna, Garuda and all, all such Vaishnava tradition gods. And then this Greek ambassador Heliodorus declare himself to be a Bhagavata. So, this clearly shows that base Nagar was not a Shaivite cave shrine, okay. Next, next question, this is also we can say comparatively a difficult thing. So, 7th August is declared as National Handloom Day. It was in 1905 that Swadeshi movement was launched on the same day, okay. So, this is the, so both the statement, so it is a statement based question, right. This is the first statement, the second statement, it substantiates the first statement, okay. So, here if you look at the content of this question, in 1905 on August 7th, Surendranath Banerjee, Anand Mohan Bose, Krishna Kumar Mitra, all these people, so they have met at the Kolkata Town Hall. So, in this Kolkata Town Hall meeting, they have released a proclamation about Swadeshi movement against the Bengal partition. So, they have declared that as a mark of protest against Bengal partition and anti-India policies of British government, the then British government, they have come up with this Swadeshi thing. So, they have asked the people to give up the foreign clothes and to take up natively made hand loops. So, that was the reason why 7th August is declared as National Hand Loom Day, okay. Next, both statement 1 and statement 2 are correct and statement 2 is the correct explanation for statement 1. Next question, in which one of the following regions was Dhanya Kataka? So, the answer regarding in which region, in which of the following regions was Dhanya Kataka which flourished as a prominent center of the Mahasangikas located? The other name for Danya Kataka for many years it was Amaravati or you can say Amaravati and Danya Kataka, Kataka almost they have coexisted together. So, this obviously is Andhra region, Danya Kataka. So, Danya Kataka it is believed to be the second capital of Shatavahanas after the Pratishtanapura, okay. So, this information we have provided in our material. So, in Certain regions, Buddhist monks lived in caves which led to emergence of cave architecture. Examples the stupas of Sanchi, Barhut, Gaya and Amaravati. So, this is the case. So, Amaravati, it was definitely a Buddhist shrine or you can say Buddhist center. So, Dhanya Kataka, so regions of Dhanya Kataka which flourished as a prominent Buddhist center of the Mahasangikas located. So, it is Andhra region, right. 
So with reference to ancient India, consider the following statements. The concept of stupa is Buddhist in origin. Stupa was generally a repository of relics. Stupa was a votive and commemorative structure in Buddhist tradition. So, so which of the above statements are correct? If you look at this question, it is a uh, what you can say straightforward question because anyone preparing for UPSC will definitely read about stupas. So, concept of stupa is of Buddhist origin, yes. So, Buddhists they were the first to build religious structures in India. So, stupa was definitely a Buddhist idea. So, first statement is definitely correct. Second, stupa was generally a repository of relics. Generally, stupas at the initial stage they were constructed for the purpose of uh, they being used as a repository of relics. So, we have three kinds of stupas, Dhatu Garbita, Paribhojika and then Uddeshika. Dhatu Garbita stupas essentially they were repository of relics. Dhatu, in Dhatu Garbita there used to be the, the relics of Buddha. So, Paribhojika they had the relics of prominent Buddhist monks. And then Uddeshika stupas, they had no relics, they were, they were just for symbolic reasons. But two thirds of this, like Dhatu Garbita and then Paribhojika, both of them they are for relics, they are constructed for relics. So, this clearly shows that second statement was correct. They were generally repository of relics. Stupa was votive and commemorative structures in Buddhist tradition. Yes, just now we have discussed, right? So, third kind of stupas that is Uddeshika stupas, they were votive and commemorative structures in Buddhist tradition. Even the, all the things we can call them as commemorative because they are constructed to remember Buddha, to remember any kind of uh, any other prominent Buddhist monk or general symbolic value. So, all the statements on stupas, they are correct. All the three, they are definitely correct. So, this thing, we have it in our material here. So, stupas, they were started by the Buddhists, so Buddhist architecture. So, Buddhism made significant contribution for the development of ancient Indian art and architecture, right. So, all these things. So, in architecture, obviously stupas. Stupas, they were dome shaped Buddhist shrines where Buddha's relics were buried. In the initial stage, they were essentially for relics of Buddha. Over time, stupa came to represent many things in Buddhist tradition. Like, votive, commemorative and then uh, for Buddhist monks and all that. So, later on they became symbols for various things. It represented Buddha's Parinibbana, it was the repository of Buddha's relic and other monks as well, right, Dhatu Garbita Paribhojika. And it stood for the Axis Mundi, center of the universe. So, it also emerged as an emblem of Buddha's Dhamma, okay. So, this is how uh, we provided all the information related to Buddhist stupa in our material. So, you can definitely answer this question. Next, next question. With reference to ancient South India, Korkai, Pumpuhar and Muchiri, they were, were well known as, so capital cities, ports, centers of iron and steel making and then shrines of Jain Tirthankaras. See, in ancient South India, they have clearly given them as South India, Korkai, Pumpuhar and Muchiri, okay. So, these three, why they were famous, so what they were known for. See, if you look at them, so the port city of Puhar became an emporium of foreign trade as big ships entered this port with precious goods. So, Puhar, it was a port town. Next. So, Eritrean, uh, so Periplus of Eritrean Sea, it was written by anonymous Greek navigator, give the information about the trade between Indian and Roman Empire. So, he mentions the port of Nauru, Kananur, Tindis, Tundi and then Mujiris, Musiri, okay. So, Musiri is also a port town. Next, if you look at our other page in the same material of Ekamaya's Academy. So, Korkai. So, Korkai which is now an insignificant village in Tamil Nadu was the commercial capital and important port of the Pandya kingdom, okay. So, Korkai, Puhar, Muzuri. So, all the three 
are photons, so they are clearly mentioned in the given source. Okay, right. So this is the reason why you need to follow right sources to get maximum questions, or you can say to reach out to maximum questions asked by the UPSC. Next, which one of the following explains the practice of Pataki Rutta? So as mentioned in the Sangam poems. So definitely it is a tough question because most of the times we do not come across it. Okay. So this tradition, in this tradition it is about a king defeated in a battle committing ritual suicide by starving himself to death. So in Sangam poems especially there is something called Puram poem. So Sangam literature it is divided into Agam literature and Puram literature. Agam literature it is related to love related things, Puram literature it is associated with war related things. In the Puram literature in Sangam era, so they have in the entire corpus of the Sangam literature, they have provided that, they, they have given that some kings who got defeated they could not bear the humiliation. So there were three dynasties, Chola, Chera and then Pandya. So when there were intense battles fought among these three groups these three dynasties. So whenever, uh, whenever uh, kings used to get defeated, so some kings they used to practice this extreme ritual of suicide by starving himself to death. So this was followed. Okay. <coughs> Consider the following dynasties, Hoesala, Gahadwala, Kakatiya, Yadava. So how many of the above dynasties established their kingdoms in early 8th century? Right. See, from 2020 onwards, we can clearly see that one question is being asked by UPSC about chronology. So there would be one question on chronology, uh, almost you can say for sure. Right. So you need to be very careful with regarding chronologies. It is not that you need to uh, do a detailed research of these kingdoms and all that, but you must have basic idea of which kingdom followed which kingdom or which kingdoms coexisted together. Okay. So this basic idea of ancient medieval India must be there. If you have that basic idea, you can definitely score 2 marks, which is a very, very valuable thing in UPSC, we all know that. So Hoesala, Gahadwala, Kakatiya, Yadava, so these four, so they did not belong to early 8th century. Okay. So you can say none. Why? Why? Because? Right. So again, if we get back to our material, so Hoesala dynasty, it was from 11th to 14th centuries. So it got established and all that. See, Dripakama was one of the early kings of Hoesala dynasty. So his reign was from 1026. So around 950, it is said to be formed, but the first ruler we have the records from 1026. So it is definitely not early 8th century AD. So next, if you look at Kakatiyas, Kakatiyas they were from 10th to 14th century, 10th to 14th centuries was the timeline of Kakatiyas. Next, Gahadwalas of Kanoj, if you look at the Gahadwalas of Kanoj, Gahadwalas of Kanoj ruled North India in mid 11th century till the mid of 13th century. Okay, so 11th to 13th centuries Gahadwalas, next, Kakatiyas 10th to 14th. Yadavas, if you look at Yadavas, the founder of the Yadava dynasty was Billama. So who became the paramount in when 1187 to 1191. So this was the time period. So he was of 12th century. So none of the four dynasties, they belong to 8th century. So the answer is none. Okay. So everyone belonged to somewhere around 12th to 14th century or at the most 11th to 13th, uh, 14th centuries, nowhere near 8th century AD. So the answer is none. Next. With reference to the ancient Indian history, consider the following pairs. Devi Chandragupta, these are all books, okay, literary works. So Devi Chandragupta by Bilhana, Hamira Mahakavya, Naya Chand Suri, Milinda Panha, Nagarjuna Charya, Neeti Kavya, Niti Vakyam, Niti Vakyamrita, Soma Deva Suri. 
So, how many of the above pairs are correctly matched? Okay. See, if you do a basic survey of ancient India, you would come to know that Devi Chandra Guptam and other book Mudra Rakshasam, they were written by a person called Vishaka Datta, right? Not Bilhana. Okay. So, Mudra Rakshasa, a great source about Mauryan dynasty. Devi Chandra Guptam, a very good source about the Guptan dynasty. Both they were written by Vishaka Datta. So, here lies the key. Okay. See, here again, if we get back to our material, contemporary literary works like Devi Chandra Guptam and Mudra Rakshasa written by Vishaka Datta provide information regarding the rise of Gupta. So, Devi Chandra Guptam, Vishaka Datta. Milinda Panha, it was not written by Nagarjuna, it was written by a person called Nagasena. Okay. So, Milinda Panha, so they were the questions asked by Minander, a Greek king, Indo-Greek king to Nagasena, a Buddhist monk. So, it was a conversation between Nagasena and Minander. Nagarjuna was a Buddhist monk, definitely he was a great Buddhist intellectual and all that, but he wrote some other things like Rasaratnakara, uh, Madhyamika Sutra, Sruhulleka, all those books they were written by Nagarjuna, but not Milinda Panha. Okay, it was by Nagasena. Next, Niti Kavya Amrita Somadevasi. One thing you need to understand Hamira Maha Kavya, Niti Kavya Amrita. These two things they were related to Jainism, the rules related to Jainism and all that. So, Suri is a term associated with Jains. So, there are many others like Jina Prabhu Suri and all that. So, Suri, whenever you see this term, it is related to Jainism, and these books they were related to that particular subject, Jainism related things. So, how many of the above pairs are correctly matched? Only two. So, both these. Jain scholars, they have uh, written these books. Next. So, souls are not only the property of animal and plant life, but also of rocks, running water and many other natural objects, not looked on as living by other religious sects. The above statement reflects one of the core beliefs of which of the following religious sects of ancient India. See, when you look at this question, you need to get the idea that this is something related to extreme form of non-violence. Okay. If somebody is saying that souls, they are related to, uh, they are not uh, only there with living things, but also with some other aspects like water, rocks and all that. So, they are practicing extreme level of ahimsa. Who practices extreme level of ahimsa in entire Indian tradition? Obviously, Jainism. So, with a basic understanding of Jainism, you can answer this question. So, if you look at differences between Buddhism and Jainism, very important topic in ancient India. So, regarding soul, soul, Buddhists do not believe in the existence of soul, whereas Jainism believes in the existence of soul in every living being. So, not just in living beings, they do believe that soul is there for even certain long non-living entities also. So, their division of uh, animals and all that their division of the living beings, non-living beings is a very complicated thing. One sense organ, two sense organs, three, four, five, in such a way they divide entire universe into several things and they want non-violence to be practiced with all the entities. So, Jains, they were the ones who used to follow this extreme level of non-violence. Who among the following rulers of Vijayanagara Empire constructed a large dam across Tungabhadra river and a canal come aqueduct? several kilometers long for the river to the capital city of Vijayanagara. Generally, whenever questions are asked about Vijayanagara empire, so aspirants expect them to come from Krishna Devaraya or at the most about the founders or Devaraya too. But here for the first time unconventionally, UPSC has gone further into this subject of Vijayanagara empire and the answer is Devaraya 1. Okay. So, it is a difficult question definitely. Right. So, in this material of Ekam IAS Academy, we have provided this information very clearly. So, Devaraya 1, 1406 to 1422, it is his time period. So, so he was a very capable ruler, 
noted for his military exploits and his support to irrigation works in his kingdom. So, Devaraya I constructed a dam across the Tungabhadra so that he could bring canals into the city to reduce the shortage of water. So, the statement given in the question, it is directly then in our source. What is the question? Across Tungabhadra river and canal come aqueduct several kilometers long from the river to the capital city. Look at this. Devarayavan constructed a dam across Tungabhadra so that he could bring canals into the city to reduce the shortage of the water. So, clearly we have given this information that Devaraya 1 was the one who has constructed this canal. Right. So, who among the following rulers of medieval Gujarat surrendered Dayu to Portuguese? So, Ahmad Shah, Mahmud Begarha, Bahadur Shah, Muhammad Shah. So, if we look at uh, Portuguese and all that, we clearly know that Bahadur Shah was the one who had several rounds of conflicts with Portuguese. So, he aligned with Turkey, Egypt, all these countries to defeat them. He could not defeat them, right. So, finally, he had to surrender Dayu. So, this is the thing and Bahadur Shah interesting thing is, he even died while negotiating a deal with Portuguese. So, he went into the ship of Portuguese, so onto the sea. So, there they were having discussions. Bahadur Shah got a doubt that they might uh, kill him and all that. So, he went and jumped out of the sea. So, he drowned because of some tides and all that. So, Bahadur Shah, he had to lose life in the hands of with, while he was negotiating with the Portuguese. This part, we have covered it in our classroom discussion as well as in the mentorship discussion also. So, Bahadur Shah is the answer with no doubt. So, around 1538, he had to surrender Dayu to Portuguese because of the defeat of the alliance between Egypt, Turkey and uh, Gujarat in the hands of Portuguese. Right. Next question. So, by which one of the following acts was the Governor General of Bengal designated as the Governor General of India? So, this thing, it is a very easy question. So, aspirants would cover it in both history as well as polity. So, in 1773 act, Governor General, Governor of Bengal became Governor General of Bengal. So, that is how Bengal Governor he got supremacy over Bombay and Madras governors, right. So, it is in the Charter Act of 1833, the designation got changed from Governor General of Bengal to Governor General of India. It was an important act. This act is also known as the Act of Centralization because the powers of provinces, they were removed and they were all given to uh, Governor General of uh, so, they were all given to the Governor General of India, right. William Bentick was the Governor General. So, when this act came into picture, okay. So, we have this detailed source also for this. So, the Governor General of Bengal, 1833 Act, Charter Act 1833, Governor General of Bengal became Governor General of India. So, clearly it is there and Lord William Bentick became the first Governor General of India in 1833. Fine, this is the case. So, thank you. Once again, we proudly remind you that our material could provide 9 questions directly with detailed information out of the 13 questions asked in UPSC history part of 2023, okay. So, this is the reason why aspirants right sources are the key to uh, success, especially in prelims. You need to have detailed information on topics because UPSC is going beyond a level and they are asking the questions at a higher level, at a deeper level. So, you need to prepare at that level to face UPSC exam. Thank you. Aspirants who want to start their preparation for 2024 or even 2025 attempt can start their preparation on a serious note with the well resourced materials of AKMIS Academy, Hyderabad. To purchase these materials, you can call to the given numbers on the screen.